Now it is? Okay. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Um, before we introduce Luke Sant, I'd like to introduce Greg Bays, Curator of Public Programs at MOCAD. Greg approached me with the proposition of bringing Luke to town, and it is one of the collaborations we've planned for this year. Greg has been a cultural promoter since 1993 and has brought programs to Detroit that span many genres and continents. When it comes to film and music, Greg has an encyclopedic mind. It is my pleasure to collaborate with him and ask him to introduce Luke Sand. Thanks, Liz. Um, I just want to say that I am thrilled and honored to be collaborating, uh, MOCAD's thrilled and honored to be collaborating with Cranbrook. This is the first time in my tenure that I think we've had something like this happen. I'm looking forward to many more. Um, in a way, I feel like we might be starting at the top, but let's see what happens. Um, so I want to thank Liz and the Department of Photography and, and Cranbrook as an institution in general for helping to bring Luke Sant to Detroit. Um, before I introduce Luke, I want to let you know that I brought program guides for our upcoming season at MOCAD. Um, they're stashed, they're hidden over there, and I will happily give each and every one of you them after the program. I also want to let everyone know that Luke will be talking at MOCAD tomorrow night, beginning at 7, an entirely different program. He'll be reading from his essays and criticism and and other writing tomorrow at 7 at MOCAD. Luc Sant was born in Rivers, Belgium in 1954, and he was raised in New Jersey. He attended Columbia University, but according to unverified sources that I confirmed a couple hours ago, he did not take a degree due to several incompletes and outstanding library fines. Sometime after that, Luc found employment in the mailroom at the New York Review of Books. And sometime after that, he became a frequent contributor to that publication. He has also been a proofreader at Sports Illustrated, film critic for Interview, photography critic for The New Republic, book critic for New York Magazine, and the crime reporter for Spy Magazine. His books include Low Life, Lures and Snares of Old New York, a widely acclaimed history of the seamy and seedy side of New York City, Evidence, a collection of photographs taken in the teens of the 20th century by the New York Police Department, accompanied by Sant's at, uh, annotations, which reveal the social fabric of the era. The Factory of Facts, which is his memoir. Kill All Your Darlings, a collection of his criticism and essays that cover such subjects as the uh, seamier side of 1970s New York, the Tompkins Square riots of 1988, the music of the Mekons, and our friend, the cigarette. Folk photography, which is the springboard board for Sant's talk tonight, and his book, The Other Paris, which examines the hidden history and the underbelly of the City of Light, will be published this October by Farrar Strauss Giroux. Among other projects, he is working on a biography of Lou Reed that promises to be an uncompromising addition to the literature about this American classic. Sant has been bestowed many awards, including the Witting Writers Award, an award in literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, a cultural award from the Belgian American Chamber of Commerce, a Grammy for his contribution to the liner notes of Harry Smith's Anthology of American Folk Music, an American Scholar Award for Best Literary Criticism, an Infinity Award from the International Center of Photography, and Guggenheim and Coleman Fellowships. Sant currently teaches creative nonfiction writing and the history of photography at Bard College. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce Luc Sant. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Liz. And i um, very happy to have been asked to come here. What an amazing place this is. Just having a little fantasy of what if I'd gone to school here, the whole course of my life could have been different. Um, maybe I wouldn't have dropped out. <laughs> so this is, um, I'm calling this the genius of the system, and I will eventually explain why. A few years ago, I drove with my partner to the artist colony in Wyoming where she was to spend the following month working on her novel. I drove back slowly across the country by myself. 
As I've done on such drives for many years, I stopped at every junk shop and antiques barn along the way, looking for photographs. Time was when they'd be crammed into drawers, piled in baskets, heaped in salad bowls, but they're harder to find nowadays, skimmed off by pickers and slapped up on eBay. At first, I found mostly generic snapshots and studio portraits, but I'm always thorough, and I always check behind and under things, so I kept looking. In the town of Gehring, next door to Scott's Bluff in the Nebraska Panhandle, I stopped at a used furniture store. Everything in the place was big. Jukeboxes, dining room tables, vintage refrigerators. But then I started looking through the glass doors of a series of hutches parked along the wall. Inside one of them, I spotted a small cardboard box labeled postcards. There were only about 20 of them, but five were real photos, and among them was this one. Dating from around 1910, and taken just a few miles away from where I'd found it, the picture is both simple and not. On the one hand, it shows what are probably after effects of a tornado, scattered wreckage, and a sign noting the location of the county abstractor, an official who maintains records of land titles. On the other hand, it appears to be an example of formal abstraction, made at a time and in a place where you would hardly expect such a thing. So it was probably an accident made by an amateur aiming for a result different from the outcome. But if that was the case, why is the picture neatly divided into thirds? Why is the right edge of the sign aligned with that of the brick wall? Why is the top of the sign positioned to form a kind of wave with the two shed roofs? Why is the, does the sign take up almost exactly the same space as the dark shed next to it, which in turn is echoed by the shed on the right? And what might the photographer have been aiming for otherwise in this bleak scene? What could be abstracter? The picture is unsigned, so it's likely I'll never find out anything more about it unless, as has actually happened to me once or twice, I stumble upon another copy of the same picture, this one bearing a caption and maybe a signature. But even those things couldn't tell me what I wanted to know. If I were to come upon a substantial body of pictures by the same photographer, I might be able to make some guesses concerning his or her interests, ambitions, work habits, sense of humor, visual education, and imaginative empathy. But even a great deal of insight into the artist's thought processes and relative sophistication might still not answer the very large question of how a work of photographic abstraction could have been made at the far western edge of Nebraska around the time when Picasso and Bach were just beginning their investigations into analytic cubism. Photography is endlessly mysterious to me, and the more I immerse myself in it, the more mysterious it seems. It has become a major part of my life in ways I could not have predicted when I was younger. For the past 15 years, I've been teaching the history of photography fall semesters at Bard College. In the spring, I teach writing, and I've written three books on the subject, as well as dozens of essays, book introductions, and catalog texts. But I came to it in a circuitous and pretty much accidental way. As a teenager, I admired Walker Evans and Robert Frank. The former became one of my, because one of my teachers gave me a copy of Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. He thought James Agee would be a good model for my writing, and he wasn't entirely wrong. The latter is a direct consequence of his cover images for the Rolling Stones' Exile on Main Street. I liked their work enough that I forswore taking pictures myself back when I was still considering visual art as a vocation, because I thought that I'd never be capable of more than pale imitation. But I didn't really start thinking seriously about photography until I was in my late 20s and living on the Lower East Side of New York City. It was the early 80s, a time of enormous change, one of the transitional signs of that change being that Astor Place was for a while a vast flea market running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The old residents needed money badly, 
and the new residents were eager to spend. So every sort of object was pulled from closets and corners and basements and trash cans and the recently vacated apartments of the dead and put out for sale on the sidewalk. One day I was coming home from work, checking out the wares, when I spotted this picture, topping a small pile at the feet of a large man staring impassively into the far distance. What the devil was this, I thought. It was clearly an original photograph, clearly old. But what it depicted was so far from the norm from the old photographs I saw under such circumstances that I couldn't quite persuade myself it could be real. And yet its authenticity was confirmed by the other pictures in the stack, more than 30 of them, the others showing American troops aboard a ship, aboard a train, parading and posing and fighting in what was clearly a Mexican city. All the pictures measured three and a half inches by five and a quarter. All were on postcard stock. None had been mailed, but some had penciled notes on their backs, and they seemed to be the work of a number of different photographers. I bought the guy's, I bought the guy's entire inventory for 10 bucks. Eventually, I learned that the photos depicted aspects of the so-called punitive expedition to Veracruz, Mexico in 1916-17 by U.S. troops under the command of General John J. Pershing. This picture, the only one to bear a photographer's signature, is the work of Walter P. Hatzel, an American who had established himself in Veracruz before the war there as a and working there as a photographer for nearly 20 years. A couple of weeks later, I happened into an antique shop on Greenwich Avenue that had a revolving rack where, amid Easter greetings and colored lithos of the Washington Monument, I found two more Mexican Revolution photo cards, 50 cents apiece. Soon after, on a trip upstate, I hit a few antique shops where I found more photo cards, not of Mexico or war, but of American small towns, train wrecks and fires and picnics and parades. I bought a stack of them. I didn't have very much money, but most only cost a quarter, some were a dime. Very soon I was seizing every opportunity to visit antique shops and rifle them for photo cards, which were sometimes filed in drawers or shoe boxes and sometimes jumbled on tabletops. A vast new world, apparently uncharted, was opening up before my eyes. I was not unacquainted with the photographic postcard per se. I spent my early childhood in Belgium, where use of photocards hung on into the middle of the century, long enough that two or three of my own baby pictures were made into cards, which may have been mailed to relatives or simply represented an option based on size but I'd never imagined the vast range of the American photo postcard. I fell entirely under its spell and collected the cards for almost 30 years. I knew very early on that I'd eventually write a book about them, and I made a pact with myself that I would stop collecting once I'd written the book. That wasn't a very good way to spur myself to write, but on the other hand, it did allow me proper time to begin to educate myself on the subject. There's not much of a curriculum, a few decent books, but their focus is necessarily narrow because the subject is so awesomely vast. The only way I could study the phenomenon of the real photo postcard as a totality was to spend 30 years looking at untold numbers of them in the hundreds of thousands at the very least. The phenomenon is tempor temporarily delimited starting out in 1905 and peaking around 1910, then dipping seriously in 1914 and sputtering out gradually through the 1920s and 30s. But there's no way of knowing or even estimating how many cards were made during that time, probably in the millions some years, nor what percentage of them survived the century. A card could have had an addition of one or of several hundred, it's always exciting to see a card a second time, although a third sighting threatens to make it common. Some cards can be identified by date, place, and photographer, while many others are completely mute. Many cards were never mailed, but saved as souvenirs. What distinguishes them from other sorts of postcards is not only that they were made in the dark room as contact prints from the original negative plates, but also that they were made in places that were far outside any tourist orbit. They were not meant for visitors, 
but strictly for local visitor, local citizens to send back to their families who were understood to be elsewhere. The American nation was still on the move then in a sort of backdraft of the original Western drive. People were beginning to populate the sorts of places the pioneers overlooked or scorned on their way toward the Pacific. Business and government were united in trying to create a breadbasket out of dry, unstable prairie. Towns would spring up like mushrooms, and very soon they'd have a brass band and a baseball team and two churches and a pool room and a drunk tank. People would drift in from somewhere that was getting too crowded, and they might stay for two weeks or for the rest of their lives. The small town and the countryside were mostly humdrum, with hard, unrelenting work repeated daily, punctuated only by small joys and the occasional gut-wrenching disaster. The photographers caught all of it. The rise and spread of the photographic postcard in America followed a template that might sound familiar nowadays. A widespread, if inarticulate, need was answered by rapidly developing technology under the cover of a popular fad. Furthermore, this new technology fostered a new form of expression, which reflected the moment and allowed it to be consumed almost in the same moment. And it was ridiculously democratic. Pictures were taken by all sorts of people for all sorts of reasons. All the extremes of photography are present, united by the standardization of the format. Pictures were made by amateurs and professionals, artists and hacks, for profit and for love, and for completely unguessable reasons. Some of their makers left behind archives and records of their careers. Others didn't leave so much as a name. It was purely grassroots enterprise. Some photographers may have been extremely prolific, may have started branch studios in other towns, may have made sure their name appeared in large letters back in front, but even their impact was almost entirely local. Besides a few trade magazines that mostly dispensed technical tips, and maybe more importantly, ran classified ads for jobs in studios and equipment, there was no connective tissue among photographers. They weren't trying to imitate anyone, except possibly some memory from among the relatively few photographs they could have seen. Sometimes, looking at these cards, you come upon a picture that makes you feel as if its maker had just discovered photography, had made it up all by himself or herself from scratch. The American Real Photo Postcard is a laboratory for the study of the social uses of photography. If you could somehow assemble all the cards that were taken between 1905 and 1920, you would have a true mirror reflection, almost a one-to-one -one scale map of the non-urban United States then, in all its splendor and misery. That's not something you can say about any other photographic format, not the tintype or the snapshot or the ambrotype or the Kodachrome slide or the stereoscope card. That is partly because those other formats tended, because of their specific properties, to be applied to, a very specific, to very specific uses and occasions, but partly also because of the genuine sense of discovery and curiosity that was both fostered and rewarded by the postcard medium. A popular documentary impulse was born of people's wish to share news of their lives with their widely dispersed relatives. They wanted to show them the new depot, the circus parade, the flood downtown, maybe even the bank heist and the lynching. And because most photographers had at best not notched an apprenticeship with a small town portraitist, they hadn't been inculcated with any principles of composition and lighting that would inevitably be tied to current fashions, so they had no choice but to make their own decisions. The best among them were able to look at things absolutely afresh. But you can't always tell how intentional any decision might have been. Like all vernacular photographs they are, that are viewed, as it were, in a vacuum, without guarantees of context, a famous signature or museum sponsorship, real photo postcards require a sort of binocular vision. They must be viewed, that is, on two planes at once, the aesthetic and the socio-historical. Few postcards satisfy both demands equally. 
the weight of the socio-historical information in any given image is such that it can sometimes be mistaken for aesthetic content. Sometimes the aesthetic measure consists of a kind of absence, an apparent refusal or inability to do anything more than state facts, which we in turn perceive as beautiful because they are so distant or so bare. Cases in which a postcard image was unequivocally intended by its maker to convey an aesthetic effect, an interior shot, for example, that is cunningly lit or expressively angled, usually seem awkward and overreaching. And yet an image rich in socio-historical socio information can be dull, can be badly lit or framed, can bury the lead in uninteresting ways. Simplicity and frontality are key to the aesthetic of the cards of early 20th century American vernacular photography in general, but they're no guarantee of aesthetic worth. But at their best, the cards represent something unfakeable, an authority of expression that seems to spring from the soil, the pure representation of a time and place, so that their essence seems to be of a piece with their subjects. While I was immersing myself in the ocean of the real photo postcard, I was doing many other things not involving photography. In 1990, I'd finished writing my first book, Low Life, Lures and Snares of Old New York, and now I had the task of finding illustrations for it. I'd never done any such thing before. I remembered photographs from the early 20th century that were credited to an agency called Brown Brothers, and I tracked down their archive, which was then operated out of a garage somewhere in Pennsylvania by a mother and son who perhaps inherited it. When I mailed them a list of the subjects I was interested in, they sent me by return mail a box stuffed with period prints, pictures a century old, some of them decorated with ancient editorial crop marks. But although many of their pictures were excellent, they didn't supply everything I needed. I'd written a book which I hoped conveyed the daily lives of slum dwellers in New York City before World War I, and yet I hadn't been able to find any photographic representations of that life beyond the familiar pictures by Jacob Rees and Louis Hine. I looked through the archives of the New York Historical Society and the Museum of the City of New York, and they lent me many wonderful pictures, but which nevertheless lack that quality of intimacy, of interior life. I visited the municipal archives and began speculatively unspooling qualities, quantities of microfilm, the collections of all sorts of city agencies, but I was getting nowhere until the director, Kenneth Cobb, asked me if I'd seen the police files. When I began leafing through the 14 ring binders containing prints made from the collection's glass negatives, I was overcome by a sensation that mingled great joy and a kind of dread. The pictures answered all of my requirements and then some. The murdered citizens of New York City in the years 1914 to 1918 were shown in mercilessly detailed and graphic photos, many of them taken in their tenement rooms as they lay surrounded like the pharaohs in their tombs by all the impedimenta of their lives. Every knick-knack and chromo and dirty dish and discarded newspaper accounted for. The lenses employed were extremely wide angle so that in shots taken from overhead, the legs of the tripod intruded like giant insect exoskeletons. And yet the lighting was somehow warm as well as pervasive, perhaps because the magnesium powder flash was already beginning to decay at the edges of the picture field by the end of the relatively long exposure so that the bodies were encircled by a penumbra. The pictures were sometimes horrifying and yet they exuded a palpable sympathy for their hapless subjects, who could appear suffused with a kind of exaltation. And while it was true the quality of the pictures varied, I could still perceive what I took to be a style. I imagined I'd stumbled upon a neglected master, some previously unknown photographer from the beginning of the 20th century who shared the sensitivity of Eugène Adjé while anticipating the unflinching stare of Ouija. After choosing a handful of pictures to illustrate my book, I persuaded my publisher to draw up a contract for a book about the photos in the archive. I couldn't shake them. They needed to be seen. I had to investigate the conditions of their making. 
When I began looking at the pictures in extended fashion, they presented me with a concatenation of puzzles and problems. It turned out that the 1400 glass plates had been sol that that the 1400 glass plates had been salvaged by city archivists from a couple of filing cabinets in a small room under a staircase that had been overlooked by the contractors hired to clear out the basement of the old police headquarters on Mulberry Street after it was sold to developers in the 1980s. The plates had been housed in individual manila envelopes, but they'd not been properly maintained. Many were cracked or their emulsion was peeling and quite a few displayed moisture rings. Furthermore, the envelopes had deteriorated in many cases so that the captions written on them, already skeletal at best, were completely illegible. I gleaned a handful of addresses and dates, a few names and not much else. I briefly imagined there would be a con corresponding dossier giving details of the cases, but there was no such thing, or at least the police department had not released such a thing to the public view. I didn't know who'd taken the pictures. Sometimes I didn't know why they'd been taken. For example, a view of a large room with men lined up against the walls, but the focus on the floorboards, which displayed no obvious points of interest. I didn't know why a subject would be photographed several times from contrasting angles with important details differing significantly from one shot to the next clothing disarranged or furniture moved around or the body itself moved from one place to another. How could such obviously manipulated scenes assist in criminal investigation? I had no idea of the criteria applied to crime scenes. Were only some cases photographed or were all the other homicides from those years among the glass plates that had presumably been removed to a landfill somewhere sometime in the previous decade? Eventually, I answered some of these questions. I identified some of the seven names that were attached, sometimes repeatedly. Four of them were policemen from the Fingerprint and Identification Bureau, which meant that they were very likely the photographers. And at least one of the other names was that of a known commercial photographer, presumably hired on a per case basis. I was able to track down some of the cases by matching their dates or names or other salient details to accounts I found in newspapers, in particular the New York American, the closest thing the city had to a tabloid in that pre-tabloid era. I speculated that the in inexplicable alteration to the scenes, contrary to the explicit instructions given by Alphonse Bertillon, the French police official who devised the standard worldwide protocol for crime scene photography, could be explained by poor departmental discipline, hierarchy disputes, a lack of understanding of the importance of photography on the part of the rank and file, or some combination of those elements. But I couldn't explain away the fundamental mystery of the photographs. Somehow a style was on display, one that had been created by some combination of equipment and standard practice, so that it could erase the differences among those seven photographers and look and behave very much like an individual manner. I looked at forensic photographs from other places and other times, including pictures made by the police in Paris just a few years earlier. There was no mistaking one for another. These pictures were as distinct as if they'd been the result of conscious stylistic decisions. And there remained, too, that nagging matter of feeling. I'd begun to think that I could divine something of a photographer's human qualities from looking at a picture or a set of pictures, something about the way human beings were depicted, something projected by the photographer and bounced back to the lens by the subject. But could I maintain such a belief in the face of the obvious fact that these were mere bureaucratic records collected by functionaries? And yet, nevertheless, something closely resembling emotion can be detected in a number of the pictures, all rational thought to the contrary. The photographs have an uncanny ability to make viewers consider such propositions as grace and soul and beatitude, and not only as the simple result of the narratives they cap. I'm getting behind in the count there. A couple of years ago, I was idly scrolling through the listings for pre-1950 photographs on eBay when a thumbnail on the left-hand margin caught my eye. 
Something about the lighting or the framing caused me to immediately identify it as a crime scene shot by the NYPD. It was one of a lot of seven assorted photos, some interesting and some not, some competent and some not, that had been taken some time after the subjects of my book, but earlier than 1950, apparently in New York City, but not in Manhattan, to judge by the building stock. The information given by the seller was scant and non-existent. They were identified as crime scenes, it's true, but I hardly needed to be told. They were original prints, which was interesting since the pictures in my book had been preserved only as glass plate negatives. The wide range in print quality indicated a variety of hands had been involved. Eventually, I bought about 100 pictures from the same source, an old woman who allowed that her father had been a police detective in Brooklyn. I didn't succeed in getting much information from her. She was alternately vague, kittenish, and obdurate. She didn't know and she didn't want to know. I nevertheless pestered her with questions for months. I wanted to know, for one thing, why there were no bodies in these pictures. It turned out she did possess a number of photographs of murder victims, but she was holding out for more money and she implied that she had a line on some well-heeled collectors, perhaps hoping to spark my competitive zeal. Eventually, I got her to send me some scans. The results came as a relief, in a way, as I wasn't tempted to spend beyond my very limited means, but overall they came as a disappointment. The pictures were brutal without mystery. They simply looked like illustrations from the detective magazines of the period. Whatever circumstances of equipment and procedure connected these pictures to the ones in my book did not hold for the photographs involving corpses. The ones pictured in 1914 had sometimes appeared to project feeling even in death. These did not. They were merely dead. The difference may have simply have been a matter of lighting, of the burst and decay of the magnesium powder, as opposed to the sustained and pitiless interrogation of the flashbulb. But I was struck by the scale of the unpopulated pictures, their depth, their focus on an unoccupied middle distance, it was as if each of them were a stage set for a play that had been and gone or maybe had not yet occurred. In each of the pictures, what is most notable is a central lack, an absence, a void. In other words, of course, they are scenes of crime. As a photographic subject, the scene of a crime is unusual in that its presence can be embodied in its absence. To hijack Randall Jarrell's definition of the novel, a crime scene photograph is an unremarkable depiction of an unremarkable view that has something wrong with it. Very often, the only hint we have that a photograph depicts a crime scene is that the subject is of such a staggering banality that it would be difficult to think of any other reason for its photographic depiction. Sometimes the image teases the eye, suggesting clues that may well dissolve upon closer examination. Sometimes the focus is deliberate and concentrated, but it's not always clear when it is simply the result of ineptitude. Sometimes crime scene pictures can resemble nature photography, but without the presence of nature. Very often the scene is as near to a blank canvas as is possible without fading entirely into nothingness. When Walter Benjamin compared Adjaye's photographs to crime scenes, he was primarily referring to the similar quality of absence in the pictures Adjaye took of city streets at dawn. But there is a difference. Adjaye's subjects are of interest in themselves. His pictures are unpopulated so that the viewer will not be distracted from the aspect to which he wants to draw the viewer's attention. In these pictures, on the other hand, there is no such inherent interest. The point of focus can only be on what is missing. It is a bit like Sherlock Holmes's dog who failed to bark. Each of these photographs is a signpost featuring a giant illuminated arrow pointing to an empty field. If you come upon such a picture bereft of any context, you will find yourself helplessly looking for a clue, a hidden statement, a punchline. And the pictures gave me even less information than the ones in the municipal archives. There were exactly two dates in the entire lot, 1931 and 1937. 
And in addition, a legible license plate on a car was a World's Fair special, 1940. It was in one noted address in four specified precincts, all of them in Brooklyn. And that's all. There are no names, nothing I could look up in the press. Much more than the earlier photographs, these forced me to consider them strictly as pictures, entirely untethered to anecdote. To begin with, what did it mean that I had immediately, in a minuscule reproduction, connected th these pictures to the ones in my earlier study? Was what I had taken for a style been merely the result of an array of circumstantial factors involving happenstance, laziness, hierarchy, bureauc bureaucracy, inconsistency, and spatial and technical limitations? And if so, were those factors unchanged in the NYPD more than 20 years later? It's true that as far as crime scene photos went, every city, New York, Paris, Los Angeles, Mexico City, Sydney, seemed to have its own distinct, what, style? Style was not the word. For one thing, even beyond the apparent moral hazard of, uh, implied by such a term, it was unconscious. Could we call it a fingerprint, a profile, an MO? The available language appears loaded, but for good reason. The connection is not idle. Detectives are in the business of detecting patterns of display or behavior that the parties themselves are oblivious to. Criminal investigation is in effect an intense critique of style, which subjects people, places, and things to a relentless examination. Every homicide detective, as rigorous as the most exacting scholar or curator or impresario or fashion buyer or grant panel judge, lavishing such attention most often upon people, places, and things that would not otherwise be the object of such scrutiny. As a consequence, criminal investigation is uniquely suited to supply a broad range of answers when we want to know how people lived, since most crime scenes are rigorously ordinary, since crime can occur anywhere, all the way from the front parlor to the crawl space under the stairs, since people do not have the opportunity to clean up for company, since crime and an economic standing are so often intertwined, since until recently most crime victims were not of a class able to afford to record their lives photographically. So it is that the archived remnants of criminal investigations of the past are superior if usually neglected anthropological documents containing incidental information that often cannot be found anywhere else. But because these are also pictures, photographs, members of a category of object that also includes deliberate confections and fashion statements and works of art, we can confer aesthetic values upon them that were never intended by anyone connected with their making, but are no less real for all of that. Style is not an endpoint, but a process, one that the photographer sets in motion, but that is provisionally completed by whoever looks at the work, so that its meaning remains in flux. Photography is unlike other arts in at least one respect. It is seldom entirely within the control of the artist and almost always represents a collaboration with chance. Even in the studio, oops, even in the studio, the photographer must negotiate with the subject, which is necessarily recalcitrant, however unconsciously. Out in the world, the photographer is at the mercy of a hundred factors, sun, clouds, wind, traffic, vegetation, dogs, cats, urchins, idlers, pedestrians, wires, poles, every sort of human caprice, and above all, the passage of time. Hence the imputation of clairvoyance to photographers, Henri Cartier-Bresson most notably, who succeeded in engaging such volatile elements to their advantage. Besides a sharp eye, decent equipment, and a solid grasp of technique, a photographer needs a good bit of luck. It's true that skill can enhance luck, that luck can to a ex certain extent be willed into being, that no one can manipulate luck without also being willing to yield, to become a mere vessel. While a willingness to relinquish full control is required by the other arts as well, as surrender to the subconscious mind, 
In photography, it is all the more insistent because of the part played by wholly external agencies, especially the mechanism itself. A large portion of the photographer's ego must be ceded to the box, which is exactly what Alfred Stieglitz and his followers were so furiously resisting at the beginning of the 20th century. Between the mediation of the camera and the interference of the 10,000 vari variables of the world at any given moment, the photographer's conscious participation in the process is severely curtailed. Indeed, consciousness can be an impediment. It is necessary for, for the photographer to practice a kind of suspension of intent. What is required is something not unlike the process described in Eugen Herigel's Zen in the Art of Archery, 1953, summed up by D.T. Suzuki in his introduction, quote, the hitter and the hit are no longer two opposing objects, but are one reality. The archer ceases to be conscious of himself as the one who is engaged in hitting the bullseye which confronts him. This state of unconsciousness is realized only when, completely empty and rid of himself, he becomes one with the perfecting of his technical skill though there is in it something of a quite different order which cannot be attained by any progressive study of the art. To invoke archery may be somewhat misleading, though unlike a bow and arrow, a camera by its nature ensures that some sort of target will always be hit, if not necessarily the intended target, nor in the intended way providing that there is film or digital memory in the camera and that the lens cap is off, triggering the shutter is guaranteed to produce an image. But regardless of intent, the success rate is wildly variable. How many exposures do even the greatest photographers make for every one they judge good enough to print? By contrast, even a thoroughly mediocre practitioner, even a toddler who's never before picked up a camera, can produce an excellent shot. It is possible to say that the process itself is responsible for many photographs, perhaps independently of human agency. For that matter, the artist in some cases may be some amalgam of history, circumstance, equipment, and association. Vernacular photography is always subject to ambiguity. Its specific mission establishes a set of constraints that can liberate an artist from the burden of excess choice, just as they can make it possible for a non-artist to produce a fortuitous work of art through a combination of luck and formula. These constraints, strategic or mercantile or procedural in design, but usually intended to reduce distraction and get to the point, function like some hybrid between the rigors and tr tradition and the chance operations of modernism. Tradition in art has benefits that are identical to its drawbacks. It allows thought to be suspended in favor of feeling, architecture in favor of embellishment, doubt in favor of faith, while the result can be feeble, servile, repetitive work. Tradition can also free the imagination by giving it something to push against. The alchemical transformation of passing trivia and historically moot tragedy into art is a process usually assigned to the artist. In the case of anonymous vernacular photographs, however, it is accomplished by the viewer who adds a decisive distance that confers upon the photographs a condition opposite to their origins, a certain universality. The viewer looks at obscure individuals and sees archetypes, looks at chaos and sees design, looks at time fleeing and sees time standing still. Photography is in several ways a collaborative art, by virtue of the relative powerlessness of its practitioners who can only frame, which is a relative and conditional operation. Because the photographer cannot assert complete control over the contents of the frame, chance determines a measure of its contents, and this, this keeps its meaning in flux. The meaning of a photograph is changed by us, and it will be further changed by our successors. Like homicide detectives, we learn to recognize patterns often by intuition and without necessarily even being able to name the connecting thread of a given pattern. The more pictures we see, the more patterns we store in our back brains. And today a child has seen many more 
photographs than even an alert and curious adult would have a century ago. Thus, we are able to recognize the beauty and meaning in pictures in the past that would have been obscured to their contemporaries by sociological circumstances. That is why our photographic pantheon can now include such disparate figures as Anna Atkins, Solomon Butcher, E.J. Belloc, Eugene de Salignac, Frederick Glazier, Mike Disfarmer, photographers who in their day remained unknown or unrespected, considered at best as competent artisans, at worst as dog and pony exhibitors. And this process will continue as we allow ourselves to be instructed by the great range of photography. Photography has been around for the better part of 200 years, and we're just beginning to plumb its depths. Decades ago, someone wrote a book about the Hollywood movies of the 1930s that he called The Genius of the System. That's a phrase that often occurs to me when I think about photography, which is not merely a technology used by individual humans to make pictures, but a collective enterprise with its own logic and an unstable collaboration between humans and machines and a way of looking that has less and less in common with the paradigms we've derived from drawing and painting. Photography is a broad continuum of which self-consciously artistic expression occupies only a small portion, but in which art can potentially occur at any point at any time. Photography involves seeing, selecting, and preserving, and that sequence holds whether the action entails choosing a site from out of the world and fixing it to film or digital memory with the use of an apparatus, or choosing a picture that has already been made and fixing it to a new context by discovering its latent meaning. But, but the latter operation is both deepened and bedeviled by the unresolvable mystery of the original maker's intention. What was this person thinking in Bridgeport, Nebraska on a summer afternoon sometime around 1909? Thank you.